Good morning, and welcome to St. Mark's United Church of Christ here in New Albany, Indiana, where we are delighted to have you, whether you are in person with us this morning or on Facebook Live. First, before we begin our time of service, we do have some announcements. We want to send our condolences to the Purdue fans, um, particularly Jane Milton. <laughs> I, where are Jane, are you here? I couldn't resist. She here today? Um, so sorry for you Purdue fans. Um, and the broken brackets. Um, we do have the flowers on the altar this morning in honor of their 69th wedding anniversary, which they will celebrate on March the 21st by Jack and Joyce Kuyper. Uh, Jack and Joyce were married here at St. Mark's in 1954 um, by the Reverend Tia Meyer. Um, that was actually before the Union of the United Church of Christ. That was when we were uh, ENR, so that's quite a bit. Congratulations to them. Today's bulletin is sponsored in loving memory of her husband, John Rosen, Re Re no, Reiser, uh, in remembrance of his birthday on March 16th by Carolyn um, and her family. This Thursday at 6:30 um, at Boomtown Kitchen, we will hold this month's theology on tap. We will have we have the room as soon as you enter into the restaurant to the right. Um, reserved for us uh, so please all that are able 21 and up for drinking those under 21 as Carter has known has uh, joins the joins us with a coke and uh, some food all are welcome um, as we will sit down uh, with yours truly and we'll take a look at my ordination paper <laughs> so come ready prepared to dig in deep into some theology this Thursday um, for my confirmand, we have one confirmand uh, with us this, this season and to my youth group. Next Sunday, we will not be with you in worship. We will be going over across the bridge to St. Michael's Orthodox Church for our worship there from 10 to 12. Uh, I will need the youth to be here by 9.15. Also, this coming Sunday, uh, Genesis Youth and our Children and Families Ministries will be having a painting with Jane. Um, which will be held in our fellowship hall. Uh, it is open to everyone at the church who would like to attend. You just have to let me know by tomorrow, by 5 o'clock, so we can get all the items that we need for this wonderful event next Sunday. And I have one other final announcement before I turn it over to Owen, who has an announcement. But immediately following worship, if I could get a few folks to meet me in the chapel um, to assist me in setting up for um, our afternoon event at three o'clock, which is my ecclesiastical council, um, which will be held for the entire association. That means that everyone is welcome uh, from any of our churches to attend this at three o'clock, but I would need some hands on getting that chapel set up. So I would greatly appreciate it if you could join me right after worship to get it all ready and presentable for this afternoon. I believe that's all I have. Owen. brief announcement, something dear to my heart. Uh, next Saturday uh, at the uh, Friends of the, at the Library, in the, in the parking lot of the library, we will be having our first book sale of the, of the season. We have books up to our hips, and we have whatever your interest is or whatever you're not interested in, we have books that cover it, so we appreciate it. And, they're, they're a bargain at 50 cents and a dollar and 25 cents for children's books. And we have a lot of children's books. So please come see us. Have I got a story for you? Several stories. 52 years ago, Pat and I were leading a United Church of Christ tour of Southern Europe to see and learn about the work of one great hour of sharing. There on the southern arid peninsula of Greece, we met with Eldon Saffer, an OGHS Church World Service worker. I can still picture him kneeling on the ground, showing us a piece of plastic pipe with holes all along it a sample of the irrigation system they were installing so that the residents there could irrigate and have crops. He also showed us beehives because the people were raising bees in order to make honey to help support their livelihood. 
and they were also raising rabbits. It was quite a production for food because you know the quickness of rabbits. So that long ago, one great hour of sharing was already at work. It had been working for at least 18 years before that, and it's still in, at work, and we are invited to be a part of it. And ever since then, when Pat and I have given a gift every year to one great hour of sharing, we remember Eldon, and we remember all of the work that one great hour of sharing does. Its response to disaster, to earthquakes, to storms, to wars, to illness, to poverty, to refugees and immigrants, and hunger, malnourishment, all over the world. In other words, exactly what Jesus would have us to do. The neat thing is that one great hour of sharing is ecumenical. So today, on this Sunday, people in dozens of faith communities of different denominations and thousands of congregations are giving to support one great hour of sharing. And the other neat thing is what we give and what we do does not duplicate what governments do. After the government does what they do, often on an immediate basis, one great hour of sharing comes in for the long haul to continue the needed support and rehabilitation. Well, what does your money do? A few years ago, school children in Zimbabwe that was ransacked by all sorts of disaster were provided with clean water and good health. Later in Philadelphia, when homes of a certain area were ravaged with floods, the federal dollars ended after they did the good that they could do, and then one great hour of sharing went in and began restoring homes, and some of that work is still going on today. Haiti, as you know, a year or so ago, had a major, major devastating earthquake. The United Church of Christ goal for, to support the work of rehabilitation there was $100,000. <clears> the gifts to one great hour of sharing that year exceeded that goal, and so that money has been used for housing, for mobile clinics, and for medicines. And who knows what needs throughout the world are going to continue. In fact, on the radio this morning, I learned that, Earth, that Ecuador had suffered a major earthquake. So it likely will not be long before our gifts to one great hour of sharing will go to support the needs of the people of Ecuador. And every gift that you make means that you are there after the storms and the devastation of war amid deep poverty and hunger and injustice. Eldon Saffer, kneeling on that arid ground, told us to tell the people of the churches in the United States, thank you. So thank you from Eldon for the gifts that you're going to give and have already given this year. If you've never given to one great hour of sharing, what a great time this is for you to start and catch up. If you have often given, you will want to keep up the good work that you are participating in. Your gifts will put you and your Christian faith into action all around the world. It is time to share as Jesus taught. Envelopes are in your pews. If there doesn't happen to be one right in front of you and you still need one, just look in the pew in front or behind or to the side. Uh, use these envelopes. You can use your own plain ones as long as you mark your gift for one great hour of sharing. And I do wish that you would take the time, not during the sermon, of course, but probably when you get home, to read these two middle pages in our Sunday order of worship for this morning about one great hour of sharing. And then listen again as Eldon says, thank you, and I thank you as we are part of a massive global effort to change people's lives and hopes. And as our pastor asks, amen. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome, no matter who you are, where you are on life's journey. You are welcome here. 
God is still speaking. God sends the light of the world into our midst to bless the humble and judge the proud, that those who see might become sightless and that the sightless might see. God sends the light of the world into our midst to debase the exalted and to exalt the debased, that those who see might become sightless and that the sightless might see. God sends the light of the world into our midst to reveal the, the sin of the saints and to give hope to the sinners. Let your light illumine us, O Lord, that we may see ourselves with your eyes. If we cannot see our goodness for yours, bless our sight. If we cannot see your goodness for ours, reveal to us our blindness. Let us go to God this morning in our morning invocation. Giver of light, we come here today seeking the way out of our darkness. O healer of the blind, let us feel the touch of your clay upon our eyes. Then we too shall bathe in Salom's waters. We shall wash and return seeing our sight restored. Your light shall burn within us, O God, and our neighbors shall behold the light of the world. Amen. Let us rise in body or in spirit for our opening hymn, hymn number 80, My Shepherd Will Supply My Need.
friends, you may be seated. Let's turn now to our call to confession. Let us confess our sins together. Dear God, we come before you as a fearful and confused people. Nation lifts up sword against nation. People extol the virtues of tolerance, but they turn their differences into occasions for saber rattling. If we had to depend on ourselves for strength, we could only despair of the future. We come to you as our judge and our friend. We ask for wisdom greater than our wisdom, vision greater than our vision, and strength beyond our strength. Befriend us new, that our enemies may no longer have dominion over us, and that we, by our life and witness, may win friends for you and the gospel. Friends, hear now this assurance of pardon. We are promised new vision as followers of the one Christ. Open your eyes and know that you have been forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Newly forgiven, let us pass the beautiful peace of Christ with one another. At this time, I would like to invite any of the little ones that we have with us to come join me up here in the step, and for those at home to gather around your devices for children's time. Okay, good morning. Oh, we have any more else out there? No, no. It's going to be a doozy of a bag of wonders. Huh? I'm just very thankful we have a custodian on staff now. So, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, do you have a favorite game you like to play outside? Any particular game? Let me think. Okay, you think. My favorite game outside is a game that my little brother came up with. So, we <coughs> move your scooter around, uh -huh. and when he says, Red, that means you stop. I mean, go. No, that, I mean, Green is go. Says stop, you stop. Okay. And then he says, glow. And, and green, green, we go. go to the okay. 
So it was a game you made up, which is a lot of fun, isn't it? Those are the best type of games. You have a little brother made up. Well, those are the best fun games, right? Well, a thing. He's at home. Is he at home today? So make sure to tell, tell him. I hope you get better. I will do that. We'll pray for him today. People have are watching us. Yes. They are watching us. They're watching us on YouTube and Facebook, aren't they? And then at home, if they're, if they're watching, maybe they might have the same things I have in my bag of wonders. Because when I was your age, one of my favorite things to do was to make mud pies. Mud pies. Oh, listen, the grown-ups, oh, they hear it too. So in my bag of wonder, I have, and I have to give Pastor John and his wife the rest of it because the ground was too hard to dig up dirt this morning. But I stopped and got some potting soil. Look at that. So I would take mud, dirt, when I was a boy, and we'd get water, and then we add it to the dirt. I don't know if it's going to really give me the consistency I want, but, and we mixed it up. All like this. Well. Did you know? Huh? Want to know a fun fact? What? Put in some, uh, a bunch of water will make it into dirt fast. If a lot more water would make it a lot more muddy, quicker, right? Well, then we would mix it all up, right? And then it's not the consistency that I was looking for, but we would get it all nuts and muddy, and we'd put rocks and flowers on it, and then we'd let it sit out in the sun and bake. We didn't eat them, though. That would have been disgusting. Do you think that would taste? Do you think that would have tasted good? No, no, no. Well, today we hear in the Bible story that Jesus made some mud and he put it on a man's eyes who was blind, and he was able to see. And even though we did not use our mud to put into someone's eyes and make them to be seen, but what made me think about Jesus today is that Jesus is always there for us, for anything that we may need. And just as he was there for the gentleman who was blind, he's there for us today. And just like your brother at home, Jesus is with him and and there to make him feel better. So during the week, we can always rely on Jesus being there for us, okay? Let's pray. God, we thank you for being there with us, whether we're here at church or at home. Be with all of us, we pray in your name. Amen. And uh, Miss Cindy's in the back if you'd like to go to junior church. first reading is from Ephesians chapter 5 verse 8 to 14 for once you were in darkness but now in the Lord you are in light walk as children of light for, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness Rather expose them, for it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you.
Good morning. You always know it's something when I begin this time talking about the Revised Common Lectionary because I want you to know who to blame instead of thinking that I picked these things out. And so churches not only all around the country but all around the world use this same lectionary including our our Catholic brothers and sisters and just a variety of of, uh, Christian churches. So this morning's reading is found in the ninth chapter of John, and it is, in fact, the ninth chapter of John. So just settle in with me. I think that you know this story, but maybe you'll hear something new in the message interpretation. Walking down the street, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents? causing him to be born blind. Jesus said, you're asking the wrong question. You're looking for someone to blame. There is no such cause and effect here. Look instead for what God can do. We need to be energetically at work for the one who sent me here, working while the sun shines. When night falls, the work day is over. For as long as I am in the world, there's plenty of light. I am the world's light. He said this, then spit in the dust, making a clay paste with the saliva, rubbed the paste on the blind man's eyes, and said, go, wash at the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. The man went and washed and saw. Soon the town was buzzing. His relatives and those who year after year had seen him as a blind man begging were saying, why isn't this the man we knew who sat here and begged? Others said, it's him all right. But others objected, it's not the same man at all, it just looks like him. He said, it's me, the very one. They said, how did your eyes get opened? A man named Jesus made a paste and rubbed it on my eyes and told me, go to Siloam and wash. I did what he said when I washed, I saw. So where is he? I don't know. They marched the man to the Pharisees. This day when Jesus made the paste and healed his blindness was the Sabbath. The Pharisees grilled him again on how he had come to see. He said he put a clay paste on my eyes and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, obviously this man can't be from God. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. Others countered. How can a bad man do miraculous, God-revealing things like this? There was a split in their ranks. They came back at the blind man. You're the expert. He opened your eyes. What do you say about him? He said, he is a prophet. The Jews didn't believe it. Didn't believe the man was blind to begin with. So they called the parents of the man, now bright-eyed with sight. They asked them, is this your son, the one who you say was born blind? So how is it that now he sees? His parents said, we know he is our son and we know he was born blind, but we don't know how he came to see, haven't a clue about who opened his eyes. Why don't you ask him? He's a grown man and can speak for himself. His parents were talking like this because they were intimidated by the Jewish leaders who had already decided that anyone who took a stand that this was the Messiah would be kicked out of the meeting place. That's why his parents said, ask him, he's a grown man. They called him a second time, the man who had been blind, and told him, give credit to God, we know this man is an imposter. He replied, I know nothing about that one way or the other, but I know one thing for sure. I was blind, now I see. They said, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? I've told you over and over and you haven't listened. Why do you want to hear it again? Are you so eager to become his disciples? With that, they jumped all over him. You might be a disciple of that man, but we're disciples of Moses. We know for sure that God spoke to Moses, but we have no idea where this man even comes from. 
The man replied, this is amazing. You claim to know nothing about him, but the fact is he opened my eyes. It's well known that God isn't at the beck and call of sinners, but listens carefully to anyone who lives in reverence and does his will. That someone opened the eyes of a man born blind has never been heard of, ever. If this man didn't come from God, he wouldn't be able to do anything. They said, you're nothing but dirt. How dare you take that tone with us? Then they threw him out in the street. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out and went and found him. He asked him, do you believe in the Son of Man? The man said, point him out to me, sir, so that I can believe in him. Jesus said, you're looking right at him. Don't you recognize my voice? Master, I believe, the man said, and worshiped him. Jesus then said, I came into the world to bring everything into the clear light of day, making all the distinctions clear so that those who have never seen will see, and those who have made... Those who have made a great pretense of seeing will be exposed as blind. Some Pharisees overheard him and said, Does that mean you're calling us blind? Jesus said, If you were really blind, you would be blameless. But since you claim to see everything so well, you're accountable for every fault and failure. May God add understanding to our reading and our hearing this day. Friends, who's blind in the story? Pharisees. Whenever we hear these stories of Jesus, what do I invite us to do? Invite us to find our story in this story. And what do I also always remind you is you never get to be Jesus. Sorry. Sorry. Chances are you'd probably like to be the blind man. I would. I'd be like the one who's telling the truth to all the people, even if they throw me out of the street. Go ahead, toss me out in the church. Throw me out into Spring Street, but I know I'm right. Eh, I'd like to be that, but the truth is, is I'm one of the Pharisees, just like the rest of us. What am I blind to? What are you blind to? What is it you don't see? Let me warn you, if you say, I'm not blind to anything, that's exactly what the Pharisees just said, right? The light of the world was there with them in that space, and they were blind to it. So let's not stand up and shout that. What are we blind to? I hate to tell you this, but we react in much the same way. I'm going to put Ken on the spot. Today is Ken's Ecclesiastical Council. We love big words in the church. I started him off this morning throwing all kind of transubstantiation. What else did I toss at you? And said, define it right now. He was just trying to find some water to make his mud pies. And he was like, what are you doing to me? And I said, this is the life of an ecclesiastical council. You've got to be ready at a moment's notice. The ecclesiastical council, of course, is, is something that we do as a church to make sure that people who are allowed to wear this are fit for the call. We have put them through the ringer, and today it sounds worse than it is, but today we're going to put Ken up on stage And everybody who's present gets to ask him questions for as long as it wants to go on. (laughs) Anybody want to trade spots with Ken today? That's right. No, thank you. And why do we do that? Why do we do this? Why do we have this process in place? Why do we have all of this process? Ken has been in seminary for four years. He has written more papers than most of us have read. Why do we do this to people? Because we have a process that we follow. It's important. 
You can't just let anybody in. Whoops. What does today's reading say about that? What are the Pharisees saying? Oh, really? Where did he go to seminary? Oh, really? What is his belief on transubstantiation? I wonder how this Jesus of Nazareth would do with an ecclesiastical council. It's exactly what they're saying. Who is this fellow we've never even heard of? And whatever it is he says and whatever it is he does, it doesn't count. It doesn't matter. Because he didn't do it in the right way. That rings true as true today as it did 2,000 years ago. What, friends, are we blind to? What do we miss all around us all the time? What is it we cannot see? It's a question worth asking every day. It's a question worth asking that person looking back at you in the mirror every morning. What is it I am blind to? Now, I agree that there are reasons that we have an ecclesiastical council. I think that there are reasons that we have seminary training. I think there are reasons that we have processes. And that not everyone who feels called to ministry is necessarily gifted in that way. I know all that to be true. And weirdly, I've been put in a position of authority over these events. But... I am still asking the question of myself as I am asking the question of you, of what is it that we are blind to? What is it that Jesus is pointing out to us this very morning as we read this story, as you heard this in your head, as you saw it playing out? What is it that you felt? What is it that you saw? What is it that convicted you? That's a little hint, a little clue of what we are blind to. So this week I began to really think about how practices that we could use to maybe open our eyes just a little bit. The first is that prayer in the morning. That prayer asking, what is it that I am blind to? Because that prayer follows a moment of humility when we have to acknowledge to ourselves, I'm probably blind to something. There is something right next to me that I cannot see. And so offering that daily prayer of open my eyes, Lord, help me to see. And then there's a practice. If you were to be standing right here at the edge of three steps and someone suddenly put bandana over your eyes, somehow prevented you from seeing anything at all, what's the first thing that you'd do? Would you run? Go, I can find my way, I can find my way, I can find my way. What's going to happen? In about two seconds, I'm going to fall down, flat on my face. Would you yell louder if you were suddenly blind? Would you say... I can find my way, I can find my way, I can find my way. No. What each of us would do if we were suddenly blindfolded, we would lift up our arms and reach out our hands, wouldn't we? And move slowly, trying to find our way through the darkness. And that's ultimately where I landed this week. When we recognize our own blindness, when we recognize that there are things out there we can't see, lift up your arms, reach out your hands. Remember these? The hands. The hands that we get busy with. The hands that we strive to do God's work with. The hands that we have been given to reach out beyond ourselves and seek out the other. Humility and prayer, and reaching out. 
I don't know what it is that blinds you, and I don't know what it is that I am blind to as well. But I know that we can learn, and we can grow, and we can change. Amen? Amen. Friends, there is so much to lift up this morning. In the life of our congregation, there is reason for celebration as healing begins after surgery. There is reason for tears after diagnosis. And there's reason for grief when the end is near. So for all of these, let us gather our hearts together and lift them to God. Gracious God, Hear our prayers this day. Hear our prayers both small and big. Prayers that may seem impossible to us. Prayers where words fail us. But we trust that you know. Prayers for those who are grieving. Prayers for those who are scared. Prayers for those who are healing. Prayers for those who don't know what to pray for. Dear God, we come to you as the same small children who would offer simple prayers to you at night with nothing more complex than that prayers of be with us sit with us hold us tight comfort us that is our prayer for all that we lift up to you and for all of those unknown to us, Lord. The world seems full of suffering, full of anxiety, full of fear. Hear our prayers this day for all of those who feel that fear and that anxiety and that suffering. And now, dear God, hear the prayers that we raise these things that are known only to you and to us.
Dear God, we trust that you hear all. Whether told to you in holy silence or shouted amidst the din of life, we trust that you hear all and that you know all. Yet hear us as we pray together, Lord, one more time in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. an invitation to generosity God gives of, of God's self freely so let us give freely to God let us bring gifts that sustain the life of the kingdom may these resources be more than enough a prayer of thanksgiving and dedication fount of blessing receive our gifts in the joy that we give them be it time, tithe, or talent, it all comes from you. Thank you for blessing us to, to be a blessing to you and to each other. 
Amen. Let us rise in body or in spirit as we turn to one another and commission one another as printed in our bulletin. Friends, let us go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us join together for our closing hymn, which is hymn number 545. There's the misprint in the bulletin. Hymn number 545 in the red chalice hymnal, He leadeth me, O blessed thought. Uh, friends, just one last time, I'd like to remind you, anyone who's available, to please come over to the chapel for a few minutes and to help Ken rearrange things for this afternoon's event, which, of course, you are all invited to today at 3. Come with your best theological questions. Ken can't wait. In all seriousness, please keep Ken in your prayers. This is something he's worked many years for. It culminates today. So may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you. Be gracious unto you. May God grant you peace now and forevermore. Amen.